distinguished colleagues, uh, distinguished members of the first panel and of the second panel, um, dear colleagues again. Um, I will try to, uh, I was given 30 minutes, if that's uh, correct. <laughs> okay. So in order to uh, be able to keep the time, uh, I will a bit uh, uh, stick to uh, my notes, if you don't mind. Because if not, then this subject is, uh, is uh, so challenging and so broad that it would be very hard to, uh, to uh, if I would not stick to my notes, to, I mean, to speak about it all day together with you, I think. So um, some introductory remarks. Um, the strategic goal of uh, the Council of Europe in the field of anti-discrimination, diversity and inclusion, I would put all these three together, um, is to ensure genuine equality and full access to rights and opportunities for all members of society. This can be achieved through legislation and policies that address inequality, stigmatization and exclusion in a systemic manner by preventing and sanctioning discrimination, racism and intolerance, hate speech, hate crime, and by devising strategies to empower minorities and manage diversity in a positive way. The key standards on uh, anti-discrimination, diversity management, are found in the European Convention on Human Rights, but not only, because the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities, the European Charter for Regional and Minority Languages, the Committee of Ministers' recommendations on measures to combat discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity, on combating hate speech, on multi-level policies, on governments uh, and governments for intercultural integration at national level, and recommendations related, for example, to Roma and traveler inclusion. The European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, the ECRI, has also adopted 16 general policy recommendations in its field of competence. One of the main tools to achieve all this is the European Convention on Human Rights and the Strasbourg Court at the service of societies of the member states. Article 14 of the Convention enshrines the protection against discrimination in the enjoyment of the rights set forth in the Convention. According to the Court's case law, the principle of non-discrimination is of a fundamental nature and underlies the Convention together with the rule of law and the values of tolerance and social peace. Furthermore, that this protection is completed by Article 1 of Protocol 12 to the Convention, which prohibits discrimination more generally in the enjoyment of any right set forth by national law. Um, Article 14, Article 14 of the Convention enshrines the right not to be discriminated against in the, I quote, in the enjoyment of the rights and freedoms set out in the Convention. The Court has frequently underlined that Article 14 merely complements the other substantive provisions of the Convention and the Protocols. I suppose this is not a new issue for you sitting in the room. This means that Article 14 does not prohibit discrimination as such, but only discrimination in the enjoyment of the rights and freedoms set forth in the Convention. In other words, the guarantee provided by Article 14 has no independent existence, as it was stated very early in 1968 in the Belgian linguistic case. Uh, and this article forms an integral part of each of the articles laying down rights and freedoms in the Convention. In practice, the court always examines Article 14 in conjunction with another substantive provision of the Convention. However, the ancillary nature of 14, Article 14 in no way means that the applicability of Article 14 is dependent on the existence of a violation of the substantive provision. Furthermore, the material scope of application of Article 14 is not strictly limited to that of the substantive provision. Consequently, the court has found Article 14 applicable to many areas, such as employment. I, do, I will not quote the cases all because that's the, a huge, huge, uh, 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 massive uh, case law. Uh, employment, membership of a trade union, social security, 
uh, education, right to respect for home, access to justice, inheritance rights, access to children, paternity, uh, right to an effective investigation, eligibility for release on parole, uh, and so on. Um, the application of Article 14, uh, read together with a substantive provision, does not necessarily presuppose the violation of one of the substantive rights guaranteed by the Convention, and to this extent, it is kind of autonomous, as it was stated by the court in Sidabra Senjautas versus Lithuania in 2004. As a consequence, the court recognized the applicability of Article 14 in cases where there had been no violation of the substantive right itself. This relative autonomy of Article 14 as regards its applicability has led to some procedural consequences. In some cases, the court has dealt first with the alleged violation of the substantive article and then separately with the alleged violation of Article 14 read together with the substantive article as in Nachova, for example, in 2005. Uh, in other cases, the court found a violation of a substantive article read together with Article 14 and did not deem it necessary to examine the violation of the substantive article taken alone, as it was in the Mola Sali case versus Greece in 2018. Um, in, in another case, which was brought against uh, Turkey, uh, the court, as the master of the characterization to be given in law to the facts of any case before it, and having regard to the circumstances of the case, went, the court went even further and considered that the applicant's complaint failed to be examined under Article 14 of the Convention taken together with Article 8, although the applicant itself had not expressly relied on Article 8. Conversely, the court may decide not to examine a case under Article 14 when it has already found a separate breach of the substantive article of the Convention. Some words about the uh, material scope of the prohibition of discrimination uh, based on Article 14. For Article 14 to be applicable, it is necessary but also sufficient for the facts of the case to fall within the wider ambit of one or more of the Convention articles. As such, the material scope of, article, uh, of, of application of Article 14, uh, together with one uh, substantive provision, cannot be reduced solely to the material scope of application of the substantive provision. As a consequence, the court has established that the prohibition of discrimination applies to those so-called additional rights falling within the general scope of any article of the Convention for which the state has voluntarily decided to provide protection, as it was in Fabian versus Hungary in 2017. The court itself has provided a number of examples of this concept of additional rights, explaining that, for instance, Article 6 of the Convention does not compel states to institute a system of appeal courts. A state which does set up such courts consequently goes beyond its obligation under Article 6. However, it would violate the article read together with Article 14 were it to debar certain persons from these remedies without a legitimate reason while making them available to others in respect of the same type of action. Um, the court has thus found Article 14 read in conjunction with the substantive right applicable to a number of circumstances. For example, it recognized that rights such as the right for a single homosexual parent to adopt a child, or parental leave and parental allowances, um, or denial of citizenship come within the scope of Article 8 together with Article 14. By the same token, the court has found Article 14 in conjunction with Article 1, Protocol Number 1, applicable to a variety of welfare benefits, for example. Um, but there is a contrario cases as well. Um, for example, in Dobrowolski and others versus Poland, uh, 2018, where the court held 
that the prisoner did not have a legitimate expectation to receive more than a half of the statutory minimum wage for work performed in prison. Then there is another um, sensitive issue. Uh, the court pointed out the horizontal effect of Article 14, meaning that the principle of non-discrimination may also apply in purely private situations. Indeed, the court has held that it could not remain passive where a national court's interpretation of a legal act, be it a testamentary disposition, a private contract, a public document, a statutory provision, or an administrative practice, appeared unreasonable, arbitrary, or blatantly inconsistent with the prohibition of discrimination enshrined in Article 14, and more broadly with the principles underlying the convention. In other cases, the court found that contracting states had not taken necessary measures in order to prevent or punish discrimination between private parties. Um, in cases concerning discrimination through violence emanating either from state agents or private individuals, state authorities have been required to conduct an effective and adequate in investigation by ascertaining whether there were discriminatory motives and whether feelings of hatred or prejudice based on an individual's personal characteristic played a role in the events, which was in Abdu versus Bulgaria or Milanovic versus Serbia. Finally, the failure, but not for the whole presentation, finally, for the thought itself. Finally, the failure to enforce a judgment acknowledging gender discrimination against a working mother, <coughs> the refusal to award compensation to a serviceman for discrimination with respect to his right to parental leave, which was Julia, the case Julia versus Romania in 2012, and the failure to enforce a judgment of the court finding a violation of Article 14 have also resulted in breach of Article 14. Uh, as I have mentioned at the beginning, um, Article 1 of Protocol, there is, we have the Protocol 12, Article 1. Article 1 of Protocol 12 extends the scope of protection against discrimination to any right set forth by law. Again, Article 1, Protocol 12, extends the scope of protection against discrimination to any right set forth by law. It does introduce uh, a general prohibition, a general prohibition of discrimination as a kind of freestanding right not to be discriminated against. The court confirmed that the notions of discriminations prohibited by the Article 14 and the Convention uh, I mean, uh, to the Convention and Article 1 of the Protocol 12 were to be interpreted in the same manner. Um, in the court's interpretation of this provision, Article, Article 1 of Protocol 12, extends the scope of protection not only to any right set forth by law, but even beyond that, as it was stated by the court in the Savest Cirkva Riec Života and, uh, and others versus Croatia, 2010. This would follow from paragraph two of the said provision, which further provides that no one may be discriminated against uh, by a public authority. According to the explanatory report to protocol number 12, the scope of protection of the article concerns four categories of cases. Um, lack of time, I will skip this part. Unfortunately, I like it very much, but what to do? Um, and um, to go further with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the Protocol 12, um, and it is very interesting that we have to read together the protocol itself, the text itself, and the explanatory report, because these two together are giving us the, the real um, sense of, of what the really real intent uh, was um, uh, by, by, uh, by formulating this protocol. Uh, and of course, which will also uh, give us a kind of um, explanation to why uh, not all um, uh, convention member states are members to the uh, protocol number 12. Um, okay, um, in the first case <coughs> concerning protocol 12, which is the uh, very famous, unfortunately very famous case 
Sedic and Finci versus Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, from 2009, the court examined the ineligibility of the applicants who identified themselves as being of Roma and Jewish origin, respectively, to stand for elections to the House of Peoples and the State Presidency because uh, they had not declared affiliation to any of the constituent uh, peoples, Bosniaks, Croats, and Serbs, as required by a provision of, of the Constitution of Bosnia and Herzegovina. The court held that the constitutional provisions which rendered the applicant, applicants ineligible for election to the state presidency had been discriminatory under Article 1 of Protocol 12 to the Convention. This case is open, is not final yet. In Napotnik versus Romania, um, judgment delivered in 2020, the court found that early termination of a pregnant woman's diplomatic posting abroad fell within the scope of Protocol Number 12, insofar as it concerned the exercise of discretionary power by a public authority. In Adam and others versus Romania, also judgment delivered in 2020, the court examined under Protocol 12 discrimination complaints by members of the Hungarian minority as regards their sitting the final high school exams. The applicants complained that they had to take more exams than ethnic Romanians, two Hungarian tests, over the same number of days and that the Romanian exams had been difficult for them as non-native speakers. The court could not find that the schedule of the baccalaureate, viewed as a whole, imposed an excessive burden on the applicants, or that they had uh, had, on average, significantly less time to rest than their Romanian peers. Given the particular circumstances of the case, the court was not convinced that the inconvenience suffered by the applicants had been so significant, as it was asked in the explanatory report, so significant as to reach the threshold of Article 1 of Protocol 12 to the Convention. It therefore concluded that there had been no violation of that provision. To date, Protocol Number 12, which was opened uh, for signature on, in November 2000, and entered into force uh, after 10 ratification uh, in 2005. Um, so to date, the protocol number 12 has been ratified by 20 out, 20 out of 46 member states of the Council of Europe. Consequently, the court has only examined a handful of cases in relation to this provision. I leave it to a discussion later on by the COFI to see why is the, uh, how, how to say the number of ratifications so low. I wanted to give you some, uh, some details about how the court understands the forms of discrimination, uh, but uh, um, I have to skip, I think, although it is very interesting, I have to say, uh, um, because, uh, well, one part only um, about discrimination by association, because I don't want to explain to you what indirect and direct discrimination is, I suppose everyone in the room has information and has knowledge about that. Uh, <coughs> so about discrimination of, by association, which is interesting that how the court is understanding this. The court has confirmed that Article 14 also covers discrimination. It covers discrimination by association, that is situations where the protected ground in question relates to another person somehow connected to the applicant. Uh, I would suggest uh, for all of you who are interested in anti-discrimination understanding of the court, uh, to, to read the uh, Mola Sali case uh, versus Greece, uh, which is very, very uh, uh, informative in many, many uh, ways. Um, but there is also a, a case um, against Croatia, Guberina uh, against Croatia, Skorianets versus Croatia, and Vela um, uh, against Hungary. Um, and one point, one more point uh, po about positive action. Um, according to the court's um, established case law, Article 14 does not prohibit a member state from treating groups differently in order to correct factual inequalities between them. Indeed, in certain circumstances, a failure to attempt to correct 
such inequality through different treatment may in itself give rise to a breach of Article 14, as it was stated uh, by the Grand Chamber in Kuric and others versus Slovenia, and in Sejdic and Finci uh, against uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thus, alongside the negative obligation incumbent on uh, member states not to discriminate, the court has also found that in certain circumstances, Article 14 may imply positive obligations on states to prevent, stop, or punish discrimination. Such positive obligations incumbent on the member states can include so-called positive measures, as it was uh, explained in Horvath and Kish versus Hungary, or kind of reverse discrimination, or as we in the academic um, writings we can read, affirmative action that a state could or should adopt to correct factual inequalities. In Horvath and Kish, um, the case was, um, uh, the, the, the judgment was delivered in 2013, a case concerning the systemic placement of Roma children in spe special schools in Hungary. Um, you may perhaps understand uh, and accept why I do concentrate and focus on um, um, segregation in education, which is also connected to my activity as a, uh, an ombudsperson responsible for, for national minorities living in Hungary. So uh, the case uh, concerning the systemic placement of Roma children in special schools in Hungary, the court concluded that in the context of the right to education of members of groups which suffered past discrimination in education with continuing effects, structural deficiencies called for the implementation of positive measures in order inter alia to assist the applicants with any difficulties they encountered in following the school curriculum. Therefore, some additional steps were needed in order to address these problems, such as active and structured involvement on the part of the relevant social services. That part, I will give you my views next time. Again. Uh, it's, it's very hard if you are also a university professor to, to uh, stick to 30 minutes, which is nothing, uh, nothing in order well, okay, but um, jump to uh, uh, three uh, as last cases. Uh, uh, these, these are actual case. I mean, actual. Um, they were delivered, uh, delivered in, in, in the last two, uh, uh, three uh, years. Um, Solchan is fresh. Uh, it came out in uh, May one month ago, or April, May. Uh, and it is also about, um, about uh, um, segregation in education. Uh, and the question which uh, we can pose is, uh, uh, do we want, uh, how to understand and how to explain, uh, um, uh, how, can, how can we desegregate uh, with individual positive measures uh, my goodness, yes. Individual positive measures um, or and broad anti-segregation policy. Uh, it is about a school in, in, in Piliščava, it's in northern, northern part of Hungary. Um, it is the most recent iteration of the court strongly confronting segregation in schools and discrimination against the Roma people more generally. Unanimously finding a violation of Article 14 together with Article 2 of Protocol 12, uh, Protocol 1, sorry, the judgment is similar to an antecedent cases, uh, broad, a very big list of cases concerning discrimination against Roma pupils and their parents in education. Um, one uh, a few months earlier uh, was a case uh, brought against uh, North Macedonia, Elmazova, also in February, which was made public in, in, in February. Uh, this Solchan judgment is unique in at least two respects. First, it is the first case to consider alleged discrimination regarding transfer to an integrated school as a specific remedy for an individual suffering from a discriminatory education. And the second, the judgment takes a strong general stance regarding Article 46 of the Convention uh, and measures 
put, uh, laid down uh, in Article 46, stating that Hungary must develop a policy against segregation in education and take steps to eliminate it. I think that's, uh, that's a very, very uh, harsh and very strong um, obligation which was uh, formulated and I don't want to speak in behalf of, uh, of uh, His Honor sitting uh, on, in the first line um, concerning this case. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, well, uh, Bakirzi was uh, the one in November, uh, which we had to, which was also um, uh, an issue of, of Article 14 uh, as well uh, concerning. Uh, National minority voting system, which is also um, well, uh, not an not an easy issue, and not uh, it is very sensitive, and well, uh, it will not be um, uh, it will be it will be I, I would say to to be diplomatic, uh, it will be very complex to address and to to uh, I mean to uh, well to comply with with uh, with, um, um, with um, the outcome of the court, I mean the the the, the Judgment and Makuchan and Minasian. Unfortunately, we do not have, or fortunately, we do not have the time to speak about it. Uh, I, <laughs> who knows the case, knows why I do I say that. Uh, it it was a very sad sad story, um, and uh, uh, I I, I uh, if you are interested, you can of course access um, the case details. So thank you so much for your attention. Sorry for being uh, well. Um, to only give, taking out some points uh, when it comes to anti-discrimination uh, in the court's practice and based on the European Convention on Human Rights uh, and what is for me a very uh, positive part uh, of the court's activity in this regard that uh, the court is uh, even more in the last few years uh, relying on uh, the uh, um, professional uh, experience uh, of uh, other um, Council of Europe bodies, so for example, the advisory committee's opinions um, uh, when it comes to uh, the rights and the situation of, of, uh, of national minorities uh, living uh, on the territory of the Council of Europe. Thank you so much. <laughs>